the more you continue with, that's a reality. Now, yes, decently and in order. I read the bulletin back there, and, and uh, you know, they evidently, the rules Brother Lee put for kids' church, they must be indecent sometimes. One of the rules was keep your clothes on for uh, kids' kids church. And so I, I was reading the list, and I'm like, wow, okay. So <laughs> you can lose your candy if you lose your clothing. So <laughs> there's... <laughs> We're in Revelation chapter 20 today, and we're nearly finished with our series in Revelation. And I do not see Tony today, and so I cannot give you information about the videos all being uploaded in order. But I will recommend for you, particularly if you've missed some of the messages as we've gone, as we've gone through Revelation, I would recommend for you to take the time to go online and watch those messages. And particularly right now, uh, there's a, there are a lot of trends per, uh, with uh, variations of uh, pre-wrath rapture and just a lot of false doctrine that's being taught that leaves believers being judged at the hand of a God who's already judged His Son in our place. And that really is the core issue uh, that has to do with the correct interpretation of Revelation where we see the church has been taken out of the world before God begins to judge Judgment has never been for the righteous. God chastises the righteous when they are in sin, but the type of judgment we see in the Revelation is not for God's people. Amen. And uh, it really makes light of the consequence of God's judgment to imply or to think that a believer could be judged in these ways because of what we're going to see as we see final judgment here today. Uh, today's message, though, is a little bit of an excerpt, uh, or I should say it, it really kind of is one, another one of those messages that stands alone. It has, it really concludes a lot of what we've seen thus far in the Revelation. Uh, but in many ways, it's a message that you could preach, and you wouldn't have had to preach all the way up to here because of the truths that we're going to see. Very, very practical message for every one of us here today. And I hope that my prayer is that that it'll be a help to you, an encouragement to you, and maybe answer some questions about things that maybe you haven't thought all the way through or you haven't previously understood. So here we are in chapter 20, and this is really the final judgment. This is the finishing of God's judgment. John said, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then we'll read verses 5 and 6. Pay special attention because we'll be in 4, 5, and 6 for most of the time today. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Father, please help us with our understanding today. Please help us to have answers about future events and answers about current events. And we just thank you so much for the promise of the help of your spirit. Teach us now. Uh, you be the teacher here today. We invite you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're at that portion of Revelation when it no longer looks as though the beast and the dragon have any kind of a chance against God. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago actually, we saw, the, uh, we saw that, uh, the, that Babylon was destroyed and we saw this great city that the lusts of men, pleasures of men had been fulfilled in, and men were lamenting and mourning. 
And if you were to read chapter 20, you would see that that great battle of Armageddon has now uh, taken place. We saw a couple of weeks ago how that literally uh, the river was dried up and made a pathway so that the wicked could come to make war against God. Isn't that incredible? That God says, okay, you want to come? I'll clear a path for you. You come on. And the wicked are coming to make war against God. They're, they're following the beast and the dragon who have uh, said amazing things and done amazing miracles. And The incredible thing to me is that any man would think that to rebel against God or to follow the beast or the devil, that they'd have a chance against God. As I read in chapter, in chapter 20 of Revelation, one of the things that uh, stands out to me instantly is how handily the devil is taken care of or dealt with. God the Son has come down with the uh, host, the armies uh, of, of uh, believers following Him, and with His mouth He has spoken the destruction of the kings and the rulers and all the men of the earth that came out to fight against Him. Literally, by the word of God's mouth, He has destroyed every wicked person. The Bible says that the blood has flown up to the horse's bridles, God has also commanded all the birds of the earth to come and to eat the flesh of men. What a gruesome scene. And they, 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 Literally, this garbage cleanup. They're going to be destroyed. Come eat the flesh and clean things up after them. By the way, having read this far in Revelation, have you noticed that the earth is in pretty bad shape at this point in time? I mean, it seems to me when a third part of the earth is destroyed and all the waters and all the rivers and, and all the streams and all the fountains of the deep have turned to blood... It seems like things are in pretty terrible shape. But God is about to take something terrible and He's about to fix it. Literally for the first time since God gave the first man the command that he was to have dominion over the earth, for the first time the earth is going to literally be brought into subjection against God. How handily the dragon is destroyed or taken care of. Uh, isn't it amazing that God Himself does not come and say, okay, Devin, or De Devin, <laughs> we got Devin. Okay, devil, it's you and me, mano a mano. God versus Satan, good versus evil. God and Jesus aren't brothers. They're not peers, they're not contemporaries. Jesus is God. And the Satan is a created being who is in rebellion against God, who because God is merciful toward mankind, has been allowed to come to the place of preeminence that he is. But my friend, Satan is no threat for God. And God sends an angel with a chain and says, go tie him up and lock him up. Literally, an angel at the command of God deals handily with Satan. That's how powerful Satan is. Mm -hmm. He isn't as powerful as the angel of God who sent to bind him and to put him in the, bottom, in the pit for a thousand years. <clears throat> Friend, there's no contest of good versus evil. There's no contest between good versus evil. You may choose evil but your consequence will be inevitable. It will come. It's not a matter of, well, you know what? If I can win out against God, my friend, evil never wins. You and I can find comfort in much the same way that King David did in Psalm 37 when he said, Fright not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down as grass and wither as the green herb. My friend, no individual has ever done wickedly and lived. Do you hear me? No individual has ever done wickedly and lived. You say, Pastor, I see wicked people living today. My friend, God's merciful and He's long-suffering. And the purpose of His mercy and His long-suffering, read 2 Peter 3 sometime, is because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it is amazing that God allows the wicked to repent, but an unrepentant wicked individual will absolutely for certain be judged at the hand of an angry God. And it's inevitable. And so you and I can find comfort knowing that any evil that is done against us, listen, God's got it handled. But you and I can also find warning in that any evil that we do, God will judge. No one has ever escaped God's judgment and this is a stern, solemn warning in Revelation chapter 20. It's also a time of great rejoicing, and it's a time uh, where things are made right. I, I like the, to read verse 4, when the Bible says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Who? And judgment was given unto them. Who? And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Well, when did that happen? Well, we see the specific time that we're speaking of here. And it says, 
and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And so we know that these would be individuals who became believers during the uh, period of seven years of the Great Tribulation. And so these would be individuals that would not take the mark of the beast, they would not take the mark on their hand or in their foreheads, they would not bow or worship to the beast, and so they were killed for that cause. And yet we see then that they become part of what the Bible calls in Revelation the first resurrection. Now this is the first resurrection within its context. My friend, is isn't the first resurrection that's ever happened. It's the first resurrection during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This is helpful for us to understand. And I'd like to refer to just a couple of things uh, to, to help us to be reminded about the resurrection. Will you please go to Matthew chapter 27 in the New Testament, first book of the New Testament, if you will please. Matthew chapter 27, I want to remind you about the first resurrection. And uh, I want to remind you about what happened at the first resurrection. Uh, in verse 50, uh, this is when Jesus is on the cross. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And then notice verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So when Revelation chapter 20 says this is the first rev uh, resurrection, it is not talking about the resurrection of the saints who had been sleeping in the graves, who had been in paradise uh, with Abraham. Uh, it's not speaking of those saints. It's talking about the first resurrection during the tribulation period. You see the context there. But it's interesting to look at this first resurrection, and it's important for us anytime we discuss these events to set straight some things that I think sometimes believers have a hard time uh, separating our understanding. See, there's a difference between paradise and heaven. And there's a difference between hell and the lake of fire. And a lot of believers, uh, we mix them all together. Now, it's true that paradise is a place for those that love God, the same as heaven is. Paradise is the same, is, is the same kind of a place for people who would be in heaven. But paradise was a sort of a down payment type of eternal life. In other words, a person who was in paradise... Because the work of the cross was not completed, they did not yet get to go to heaven and be present with the Lord. I love what Paul tells the church at Corinth when he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's what happens today when a believer dies. But back then when a believer died, he went to paradise. It was a waiting place. It was not a place for soul sleep, but it was a waiting place for believers because the blood had not yet been offered in the throne room. The final sacrifice for sin had not yet been made, and so man was not yet reconciled to God, and so man could not just die and go to be with the Lord. He was waiting for the promise. So you can imagine with me how much anticipation there was even in paradise for the work of the cross. And what a day, what a time of rejoicing it would be when outside of the city of Jerusalem, those individuals, when Jesus said, It is finished! And the rocks, uh, there was an earthquake and the rocks ripped in half and the veil of the temple from the top down to the bottom ripped wide open and signifying that God's presence was not in the temple. That now God would dwell with men and now God would be uh, live inside of men and God's presence would not be restricted to the temple but that man would be able to go into the presence of God right in heaven and so there was no barrier anymore. There was no veil. There was no separation between God and every single man because of the work of the cross being finished. And at the same time, the graves were open, and the believers came out of the graves. They were resurrected. The Bible says they went into the city of Jerusalem. Where did they go after that? Well, they went up with the Lord Jesus. They went to heaven. And that's where they are today, those saints that were resurrected. That's the resurrection uh, that came as a result of Jesus Christ's resurrection. That's the resurrection that's argued in the letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, about how in chapter uh, was it chapter 15 that if Jesus Christ isn't risen, your faith is vain, and you're yet in your sins. But Christ now is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept. Those that slept were the individuals that are in paradise. They're the first fruits. There's also a difference uh, between. Oh, okay, so now let me just explain as well. Paradise was we believe to be in the center of the earth. And uh, let's read the description of it in Luke chapter 16. If you will, please, we see two individuals went to the same place, but there was a gulf or a separation. So Luke chapter 16, most of you know the account of the rich man in hell, but it's a good picture, a good explanation of, uh, 
of how that hell and paradise uh, were holding places, waiting for the final resurrection. Somebody tore Luke out of my Bible. I can't find it. There it is, Luke chapter 16. And go down with me to verse 19. We'll look at this, look at this story of the rich man and a man by the name of Lazarus. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Let me just stop here just for a minute and help you with your thinking. You know how you think affects how you feel? Sometimes the way we feel affects how we think, but the actual opposite should be true. You know, if you feel grateful, you'll be amazed at how, be how much better. Or if you, if you think with gratitude, you'll be amazed at how much better you'll feel about life in general. It's just incredible when a person looks at what they have to be unthankful for versus what they have to be thankful. When they look at for something that's wrong instead of something that's right, it's amazing what a different outlook our entire life is. You know, I came to the conclusion several years ago, and I'm firmly convinced and will be forever, uh, that I just don't have anything that isn't just fine. If you were to ask me, Brother Price, what do you need? What do you need? You know what my answer is? I'm not like those that say we're rich and we have need of nothing and they don't see that they're blind and that they're naked and that they have need uh, of everything. No, my friend, I have Jesus. And Jesus is all I need. The truth of the matter is you could take from me anything that I have, anything even that I feel is a necessity for life, and because I have eternal life, I have everything I need. If God gives me things, and He does, but if God gives me something, it's a blessing, but it's not what I need. What I need is Jesus. And if you come to the understanding, the place that all you need is Jesus, my friend, you'll realize how well you have it. You know, life itself, not only is it a vapor, but my friend, it's a vanity. And when you begin to live for the things that can be realized and that can be had in this life, my friend, you're going to come up very empty. And you're going to come up wanting. You know the thing most people need in life? Well, it's the thing that you can have in Jesus' relationship. Most people need relationship. You know what you find out in life? Relationships are all temporary. And you'll be so struck, so sad. This, this Christmas season, I don't know how many people that called me or spoke to me that said, I lost a person or I lost a relationship or whatever. And they are in absolute despair because a relationship that can only be had in this life, they don't understand, can be had eternally. And because of that perspective, my friend, every one of us is going to come to a place, if this is what I have to have, we're going to come to a place of loss. And when we lose that, my friend, you will have no hope. But when you realize that in Jesus Christ, everything we ever have, we always will have, you realize I can't lose anything that matters. Not only that, I can't lose anyone that matters if they're in Jesus Christ. It's the most comforting thing in the world. does not make separation any, more, <coughs> any easier. does not make sorrow. Uh, it, it just makes it sweeter. It just makes sorrow a little bit sweet, knowing that there's a hope and that it's only a temporary, that relationship's only a temporary separation. Lazarus, though, would be one of those people that if he had the wrong attitude could say, my life is a living hell. I am... I feel uncomfortable making that statement. It's just that I've heard it so many times from people. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, my life is hell. And they think, you know, you've never read the Bible. You don't know what hell is. And it's blasphemous to me for someone to say something like that. Because hell is a place of judgment. And friend, this life, if you're living and you're breathing, is a place of long-suffering and mercy. You hear me? If you're breathing today, you are experiencing God's withheld judgment. And as God is saying, I don't want to judge you. My will, my desire for you is not to destroy you. My will, my desire for you is to be merciful for you, to you. And my friend, that's what this life actually is. You may be suffering, but you are alive because God is merciful. It's the wrong perspective. Lazarus, the Bible said, laid at the rich man's table. He was full of sores and he begged for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, how would you like that for a subsistence? It doesn't look good. The Bible said about the rich man um, that it came to pass in verse 22 that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. The Bible says and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. 
Now, it doesn't take a, uh, a uh, rocket surgeon to be able to figure out that hell is a place that is not a pleasant place. It's a place of torment. There are individuals that think that because hell is, uh, you know, because hell is the place that's reserved for the devil and his angels, they think, first of all, the devil's there. Friend, the devil's not there. He's on this earth right now. He's walking about. He's roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. So the devil and his angels aren't in hell. Only people in hell are people who have refused to receive Jesus Christ. And they're in hell, and hell is a place of torment. We're told in other places that hell is a place of fire. It's a place of darkness. We're told about the hell and the lake of fire. It's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so the rich man is not uh, having a casual conversation saying, Yo, Abraham, hey over there, how is it? No, he's a place where the great gulf fix and in torment. He's screaming out to Abraham. And he's having this conversation to Abraham in torment. The words do not exist that could give the emotion, that could give uh, the inflection to the words of the rich man as he is burning in hell. And so we're just simply given a very, very calm uh, example of the discourse between Abraham and between the rich man. But as I imagine, and as much as I'm able to imagine, I imagine the rich man in agony, crying out, to Abraham and begging for these things. The Bible says in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torment and he saw, what did he, what did he see? Well, he saw individuals that were not in torment. And here's a reminder that for a person who chooses God's judgment instead of God's mercy, that you will be very aware and while you're being judged of the opportunity for mercy. Can you not imagine what it must have been like to be in torment and see Lazarus? just fine. Lazarus waiting for the promise, waiting for the work of the cross to be fulfilled, but Lazarus in paradise. Lazarus is just fine. And the Bible says, He seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so hell is a place of flame. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy life receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and now thou art tormented. Now this is not some kind of karma. This isn't that you had it good, now you're going to have it bad. Well, I'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? Because I've had it pretty good in this life, to be quite frank with you. You know, I don't compare myself with anyone, but I'll just tell you this. God's been very good to me my whole life. He's always been very good, and I know it. I know God's been good to me. And uh, boy, if that meant that in the future that I'd be in torment, I'd say, God, be, I, I want source. I want to lay at the rich man's table and I want, to, I want to eat crumbs because I don't want to be in hell. That isn't what causes hell here. It's not karma. It's not you, were, you had it good and now you've had it bad. But what he's trying to remind the rich man is, is when you had it good, you didn't care about the important things. But when Lazarus had it bad, he still cared about the important things. By the way, my friend, you know, a mindset of understanding our need is important for us. Whenever a person sees themselves as not having a need is when a person falls into the trap of overlooking what God has provided for us. Have you ever tried to share the gospel with someone and they say something along these words? This is how the vernacular goes most of the time I hear it. I'm good. Hey, I'd like to just share with you. I'm good. What does it mean? I don't want to hear it. What it really means is I don't need anything. I have everything I need. But you don't if you don't have Jesus. Do you hear me? If you don't have Jesus, you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you're not good. We know, of course, that the phrase is fallacious because there's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. There is none good. No, not one. There's nobody. There is no one who is good. No one is good. And when you see yourself as having everything, you don't see yourself as needing anything. And if you see yourself in the wrong light, then you won't know that you need Jesus. Jesus told the disciples that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it was for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is not saying rich men don't get saved. What Jesus is saying is that a rich man has something to overcome in order to be saved because he has to see himself as having a need. You know, many times individuals who have been pretty well off in life have come to a place because of things that have gone wrong that they've seen their need. And I've had to tell them, you know, one of the best things in the world that could ever happen to you is for you to come a place, come to a place where you realize that you need God. 
many of us. You know, you say rich, riches, you know, Pastor, I, you know, I'm not a billionaire. I don't think there are any billionaires in here today. You've kept it a good secret if you are, and you haven't been a good friend to me. But the reality of it is, is that uh, I don't think we have any billionaires here, and uh, all of us, I think, would agree that a billionaire would be rich, right? Most of us think a millionaire would be rich, but actually, for many of us, we think that anybody who has a car and a house is rich. And you know what? That standard goes down and down, right? Anyone who has a bicycle and knows where their next meal is coming from is rich. Rich is a certainly a relative term, actually, isn't it? And you know, just having you know a t the tiger by the tail, or or having having the world by the tail, really, and, and just having life figured out, or so you think, oftentimes is enough riches that many people don't see themselves as needing the Lord Jesus. I don't think that's what they need. You ask the average person, what is your greatest need? And you'd be surprised at what they say. Hmm. What's your greatest need? For, for a person who's wealthy, they need one more dollar. For a person who has a lot of relationships, just a little bit more. For a person who has a small house, they need a big house. For a person who has a good job, they need a better job. Whatever it is they have, they think they need that, but they don't think they need Jesus. And Jesus is our greatest need, my friend. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. And thank God for every one of us that have been brought to a place when we recognize what I need isn't something, what I need is someone. It's Jesus. All I need is Jesus. And this rich man never had that in his life, never acknowledged it in his life. He had a man who was a testament that he needed. You know, if he'd ever had enough compassion to look down at Lazarus and say, what's going to happen to this guy? What's going to be his future? How's it going to end up? He might have found some answers to some questions that he had because Abraham told him, you have Moses and the prophets. He's speaking of, uh, of them. Listen to what he said when he asked him to testify to his father's house. Verse 7. Oh, let me talk about the permanence of hell. Verse 26 quickly. Uh, Beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now, I don't know why any person would desire to go from paradise to hell, but you could because of the gulf that was between the two. In other words, here's paradise, and here's hell, and there's a, there's a division between the two, and you can't overcome that. You can't go from one to the other. Regardless, if you desire to go from hell to paradise, or paradise to hell, that's a separation. That's a permanent separation. Can I remind you, hell is a permanent separation. And so his next response is, warn my brethren, warn my brothers. In verse 27, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. What is, why is he calling Abraham father? Well, because he would have been one of the descendants of Abraham. Abraham would have been his father physically, but actually he would have been like uh, he would have been one of those individuals described by Jesus when he said, "We have Abraham to our father." Jesus would have said, "You have your father, the devil." So he's calling Abraham his father, but actually the devil is his father. Descendant, as far as his descent goes, yes, he's from the seed of Abraham, but as far as his heart goes, he's from the seed of the devil. He is of his father, the devil. And in verse 5, he says, I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And here's Abraham's response. And boy, this is profound. And we ought to get a hold of it. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. When he said they have Moses and the prophets, does that mean that Moses was living? No. We're he's talking about the Word of God. Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the prophets, all of the different books of the Old Testament of the Scripture. They have the Word of God that tells them definitively who God is, and not only tells them who God is, but tells them how they can know who, how they can know God, and how they can avoid future judgment. And their response, and the rich man's response, was to not believe. Now, lest you should fall into the trap of saying, "Well, once I'm in hell, then I'll believe," my friend, you know it doesn't have to be that way. But you will believe. Uh, there'll, there'll come a time. The Bible says, "When every knee is going to bow." And every good tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It had better be sooner than later. Soon rather than late. Because by the time this individual is a believer, he has ignored everything he had. And here's the second thing that's taught here that's important for me. And it sheds a little light on something I used to think. You know, I used to think that the reason people didn't believe was either because they had not heard or because that the message was not convincing. You ever feel inadequate to preach the gospel? I always do. I always do. I feel as though when I preach the gospel, man, you know, I just can't be convincing enough. You know something I realized a long time ago? That the gospel and the Holy Spirit of God are the convincers. I'm just the conveyor. I have to convince people. 
uh, the message is true and it convinces anyone who's willing to be convinced. Do you remember when Jesus used to do miracles? You remember the commentary of the gospel writers after they would tell about a miracle Jesus did? It would say something like this, and many, what's the next word? Many believed and many believed not. How do you see the same thing and draw a different conclusion? It's your heart's desire. You don't want to. You ever seen something and you ever known something and you just didn't want to believe it? We're, we all do that, don't we? You ever just not want to believe something? Maybe hey, about someone. Man, poor teenagers in a relationship and they, you know, he, he doesn't really love you. Oh, yes, he does. Friends are like, well, I don't really believe Oh, yeah, he does. Hey, well, you believe what you want to, but the truth is otherwise. And you ever... Um, Sometimes it's evil. Sometimes we believe evil in spite of the facts. Because we just want to believe something bad about somebody. But you know, facts are facts, and Jesus is God. And the Bible's the Word of God. And there's a heaven and there's a hell. And uh, whether you believe it or not has nothing to do with the information. It has to do with your response to the information. And Jesus herein tells Lazarus, you know something, your brethren in your father's house, they have Moses and the prophets, and if they will not believe them, Neither will they believe though one were to come back from the dead. If Lazarus went and told them, they'd say, yeah, it's an aberration. Lazarus didn't actually die. It's fake. He faked his death, and uh, he faked being sick. He faked everything. It's all fake. I don't believe it. They had to come up with a reason not to believe. There is nothing, that, there's nothing listen to me, there's nothing that will convince you against your will to not believe. The converse is also true. Anyone who believes can. I've had people say something which is one of the most disingenuous statements. They've said, you know, I wish I could believe that. That's a lie. If you believed it, you would. In other words, not I wish I could. You could believe. What you're saying is I'm not willing to believe that. Listen to me. I'm trying to be as real with you as I can today. You're an unbeliever. It's not because you cannot reconcile the facts. The facts corroborate for any person who will believe. It's incredible when we begin with a heart of faith how that everything so clearly fits and so clearly makes sense after you begin with belief. But you begin by believing, my friend. If you don't believe, it's because you're unwilling to do so, not because you cannot do so. I've spent enough time there. Let's find our way back to Revelation chapter 20 and wrap things up today, if you will, please. We began that long excursion into Matthew 27 and into uh, Luke chapter 16 because of the reference to the first resurrection. And I was here showing you that the first resurrection included in Revelation chapter 20 or, or mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 where these saints are part of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It's not the resurrection of the, of the saints at the culmination of the events of the cross. It's the resurrection of those individuals who have been killed during the tribulation period. Let's look at the description and you'll see what I'm saying. In verse 4, I saw thrones and they that sat on, upon them in judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now if we were to read back a ways, we would see the 144,000, and we would see other individuals who believed the evangelists or the witnesses that taught the truth about God, and they did not bow to the false prophet, and they did not bow to the, de the devil, they did not worship the beast. So these are individuals that because they would not bow to the Satan, the beast, and the false prophet were put to death. And God resurrected them. God raised them up. And that's the first resurrection during before the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's the millennium, or it's the resurrection after the rapture of the saints. Alright? So let me just say that last phrase again so you can, you can meditate on it later. It is the resurrection after the rapture of the saints. And so the Bible says also that they're going to have the privilege of not being touched by the second death. Now there are a couple of implications uh, of that in, in verse... Um, oh, let me, let me get down. Let me, let me come to, to... Let me not get ahead of myself here, if you will. That's verse 14. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, so what are the dead that didn't live again? Well, these are the individuals that died during the, year, during the tribulation period. And if you'll go with me down to uh, verse 11, we see, well, let's go to verse 10. 
after the devil has been released and after now he's being brought to judgment. In verse 10, the Bible says the devil that, was, that deceived them uh, was cast in a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. For how long? Forever and ever. It's a good reminder to us how long judgment is for. And in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there is found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Okay, which dead? Well, these would be the individuals in verse 5 as well as all the dead uh, for, uh, from, from, the first, from the first Adam. Stand before God. The Bible says the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You want to be judged by your works? This is your judgment. You want to be judged by the righteousness of Christ. You want to be judged by whether or not you believed in Jesus? Then it will be the works of Jesus Christ. My friend, you don't want to be judged by your works. Any person that says, God's going to judge me and thinks they'll stand in good stead is in a lot of trouble. If you come before this great white throne judgment, my friend, guilty, 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 there's no plea for innocence. And there is not only a no plea for innocence, but there is no judgment. Or there is no judgment of innocence either. And then we see in verse 13, the sea gave with the dead which were in it. Which did? Well, these would be the individuals that would have died during those, during those uh, uh, the, the uh, woes of the angels as well as others. And the Bible says, and they were judged every man according to their works. And then the Bible says, and death and hell were cast in a lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay, so the first death that we're talking about here is when a person goes to hell or when the person physically dies. The second death is final judgment. And there isn't a place, I'll remind you, between the first death and the second death for repentance. The place for repentance is where we conclude today. The place for repentance is now. The time for repentance is now. My friend, anyone who is under the hearing of my voice, anyone who is living and breathing is living and breathing because God has given them breath. And God has given them breath for the purpose of repentance. What is repentance? Well, you know, some people try to categorize repentance and make it only one thing. But repentance ultimately is about Jesus. See, every person in the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you, if you get what you deserve for sin, you get death. And death gets you judgment. But the Bible says God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's the object of our repentance? Jesus is. Jesus. You know, so many individuals are willing to be judged by God and unwilling to receive the work of the cross. And that is such an amazing contradiction to me that I cannot comprehend it. My friend, Jesus died and He never sinned. He died for sin which He did not commit so that you and I could have His righteousness. It's a no-brainer. Repentance is turning. Turning from our dead works, which will lead us to God's judgment, to faith in Jesus Christ from dead works. Turn from dead works to faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's as simple as it is. And it cannot be any simpler. You say, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know if I have enough faith to believe. I love how Jesus illustrated faith, and I'll conclude with this. Can't, can't emphasize this enough. In John chapter 3, when Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus the simplicity of salvation, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. As simple as it was for the children of Israel who had been bitten by a poisonous serpent to turn their heads and look at the brass serpent, that's faith. Looking. Say, Pastor, I can't believe enough. You could believe enough. God, I want to be saved. You say, well, I don't know if I even believe in God. Yes, you do. You're believing lies. You try to say you don't. Well, I don't know if I could really mean it if I called out to Jesus Christ. Listen, call out only to Jesus. Just look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want God, I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. And in the same way, you think any person who looked at the brass serpent doubted before they were before they were healed? Think any person who came to Jesus ever doubted? It's not addressing doubt, it's addressing belief. The fact that you want to be saved, God accepts, my friend. 
The fact that you want to believe in Jesus, that's a choice, it's a desire of the will. And the choice to put your faith in Jesus, my friend, God will receive it. That's repentance. You say, you mean you don't have to do anything to be saved? Jesus did everything so that you could be saved. You trust Jesus as your Savior, and all of a sudden you'll find, yeah, I, you do, I, I do believe. How I many times I have been with an individual who desired to be saved, but didn't know if they were sincere enough, or didn't know if they could believe enough, or if they were ready to turn over a new leaf and to change their life and all those things they thought they had to do. And when they came to the understanding of all I need to do is look to Jesus, all of a sudden they could do all the things they didn't know if they could do. Because it's God that does those things. All we have to do is believe. And here I see the greatest tragedy in the world. I see death and hell being cast in the lake of fire. And I see all these individuals to see giving up the dead that are in it. And I see all the dead being brought up before God. And I think of the tragedy of it because not a single one of them, not a single one of them had to face God's wrath. It was a choice in every instance. And just like it's a choice of belief, their choice was unbelief. And no one here today can say, you know, I left that place and I, I just didn't make a decision to believe. No, my friend, not making a decision to believe is making a choice of unbelief. Remaining in unbelief is a choice of the will, just like believing is. And all of us are faced with it, faced with the reality. And we won't be able to play any games, uh, any semantics when we stand before God and say, well, God, I didn't exactly not believe. I just didn't quite believe enough. or what." No, you either believe or you don't. It's an either or, and it's very, very simple. And God isn't playing games and uh, dangling men in, in dangerous places and, and uh, making them doubt or uh, making them unable to believe. God's made it simple. It's as simple as this. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. It's as simple as that. Amen. Is your name written in the book of life? Is your name written there? How's it get written there? Not because of anything you've done, but because of belief. And as I look at all of these complex circumstances, and I look at how terrible God's hand of final judgment is on the world, the thing I'm reminded of is how simple it is to not be in that place. How easy it is to receive Jesus and become God's child and escape judgment. Friend, I feel as though I should be there, to be honest with you. I know that I'm not any better, I'm not one inkling, one iota better than any person who's ever faced God in judgment. But the difference between me and that individual is that I'm willing to bow and say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. So do we all, don't we? Everybody needs Jesus. Have you received Him? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? In just a minute, I'm going to have a private time in our service, and I'm going to, I'm going to finish our service in prayer, and then we're going to just have a private time, what we call an invitation. And we won't sing or anything like that, but I would like to have everyone here, uh, I would like everyone to be able to leave here with the confidence that you know that you have eternal life. And so we're going to pray, and then we'll have a short time of invitation. We'll be dismissed. Let's do that now. Father, thank you so much for what we've learned from the Scripture today. God, it's very, very enlightening to understand the difference between paradise and hell, and, and uh, hell and the lake of fire, and heaven and paradise. And God, our conclusion today is that we don't want to be any part of your hand of judgment. So I ask for the convincing of your Holy Spirit. God, the things that your Word says here are true. And everyone will acknowledge them. But my particular desire would be that they would be acknowledged today so that they would not have to be acknowledged in the wrong way. So I pray for just convincing of your Holy Spirit. Now before we finish our prayer, I'm going to ask every person here just to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. You don't need to lean forward, but just keep your eyes closed. And the reason is for the sake not only of your privacy, but for the privacy of every other person here. I'm going to ask some personal questions. and. You wouldn't like anyone to pry into your personal matters, and so we'd ask that you'd give the same respect to every person here as well. I just want to ask a simple question, and it's not a trick question, but the simple question today is, if, if um, you were to stand before God, would you, would you stand in the place of judgment or, or His mercy? If you know that you've received Jesus as your Savior and that God's already judged His Son in your place, and you know that you have eternal life, uh, and you're confident of that. Could you just slip your hand up just so I could know that? You know, I know that I have eternal life. Just slip your hand. I don't want to look around and look at anyone else, but I know I have eternal life. Just slip it right back down. Okay, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Price, I'm uncertain about that. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. 
and I wouldn't do that for the world. But I'm, I'm concerned today about my eternal life. Uh, don't call, make me come forward. Don't make me do anything. But I, I do want you to know, I want you to pray for me because the matter of my eternal life is something that I have not settled. Uh, and I'm just asking you to pray for me here today. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll talk about it in, in the future. But would you pray for me because I, I'm not sure that I would escape God's judgment if I were to stand in the place of the dad in this, in this situation. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, please pray for me. Don't embarrass me. But pray for me. I'm concerned about my eternal life. Okay? Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for the confidence that we can have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as a result of the message that we've heard today, that we would be burdened to share not only the simplicity of the gospel, but God, the fearful wrath of God that is inescapable for those who remain His enemies by their, by their will of unbelief. Go with us this afternoon. God, I pray your blessing on each of the saints that are here today. I pray that you would give us an urgency as we preach the gospel message that we would see with compassion the ultimate demise of the wicked. And Lord, we know that we're no better than anyone else, but by the great grace of God, we've been redeemed and we praise you for it. We just thank you so much for the message here today and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your great attention this morning. You're dismissed.